Thank you all so much for coming. Um, some of you were here, if there's some new faces, we're here when I used to be the community manager at Lenaro, and so um, being back here today is like a, it's fun, and I'm, and I'm happy to be back. It's good to see all the changes that have happened and where you all are going and what you've added in the last three and a half years, and I want to talk to you all about how you can collaborate um, with us. Come on in. What is OCP? For those who don't know, we're a 501c6 organization that was uh, found, founded in 2011. We're, we, we focus on the data center ecosystem. Our original founders were fat, uh, Facebook, Rackspace, and Intel. I about combined three of those names. It didn't, wouldn't sound very nice. We have about 55 members now, and we're actually, since the time this slide was made until today, we actually have about 160 seven members now, we're adding about three, three members a week. Um, our current board members, Facebook, Rackspace, Intel, Microsoft, and Goldman Sachs, 52 design contributions, 11 different companies, and we have more than like 80 more that are in the pipeline being reviewed right now. And one of the, fo one of the groups I'll focus on later is our networking group, because um, you guys have LNG, and we have our server group, and um, you guys have your enterprise group. So there's some overlap in those areas. Um, we focus not only on Greenfield, but Brownfield data centers as well. There's some, uh, I guess, misconceptions around that we're solely focused on Greenfield and the 21 inch open rack. We both, we have 19 inch EIA um, contributions as well and networking gear. And while we, we do have our, our technology focus and you'll see um, in another slide our, our industry um, focus and, and our technology verticals, our, our industry verticals and our technology verticals to form nine top level groups. We're very, like, someone says, well, why you're doing open hardware, why don't you do all things open hardware? We're focused solely in, near, and around the data center. So as you can see, our initial focus was leveraged by the Facebook designs and, and Companies such as Goldman Sachs and, and Rackspace and others leveraged those designs and made changes themselves. We now have, like I was saying, over 4,000 engineers that participate in our organization. Um, and we have, not, again, nine top-level projects. We have our project groups and we have our incubation committee. Our incubation committee um, is the committee that um, is responsible for voting in every contribution that we have. And so we... We usually, all of our hardware contributions are governed by either the OWF license, which is the Open Web Foundation license, or the two licenses that we've written. We have a hardware license that's based on the Apache um, style open source software license and a license that's based on um, the GPL v2 licensing. So we're, we're moving beyond the Facebooks of the world and the Microsofts of the world. Um, we have other uh, telco financial hosting markets and, and we're looking, we're always being uh, approached to look at more industry um, markets as well. What are we looking on for going forward? Not only are we focusing on the hardware ecosystem around the data center, and hardware is great and opening up the hardware is great, but at the end of the day, and to drive adoption, it's will my software work on your hardware? So now we're looking on uh, driving both the innovation piece and the adoption piece and making sure that uh, software um, is working on our hardware, so we're enabling a software ecosystem as well. Some of those future initiatives include an, an interactive web portal. So think about like a Zappos website for open compute hardware. So I like shoes, so I want to, you know, can search colors and types and all that good stuff. And then, you know, we're going to focus on user validation, creation of that uh, support, shared support ecosystems in that or technologies in that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to partner with other groups. We don't need to create a whole other certification layer when there's other groups that do that better than we do. And again, creation of the software ecosystem. So that's sort of the, the overview there. And I talked about how it all began. When <clears throat> So any questions so far? I'm going to dive pretty deep into some of the stuff. Um, No. 
So um, that's something that's very near and dear to my heart there, um, and we're working on it. It's just a searchable database. So in order for, you'll see when we talk about how something becomes open compute, how, we can, how someone can brand their product as open compute, one of the things they have to do is give us the orderable SKUs. It's based on the specification. We have the design files. Um, we, uh, and then um, for those orderable SKUs, we have, you know, who is selling it, that kind of stuff. So you could go in and say, I want all open compute servers that fit into a 19 inch EIA rack. I want to see all open compute servers that go into a 21 inch open rack V2 format, or I want to see all the OCS contributions, or I want to see barrel eye. And you can search that way, and it'll come up and tell you where you can go and get them. Right, right. Because we as a foundation are not, um, we don't manufacture anything and we don't sell anything. We just enable the ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem. So that makes make sense. So um, in 2009, Facebook started looking at how they wanted to redo their data centers and how they wanted to um, look at being more efficient. And in 2011, as I mentioned, Rackspace, Intel, and Goldman Sachs, Rackspace, Intel, and Facebook um, incorporated the foundation. They invited Goldman Sachs and Andy Beckersheim to join the board. So those are the, the five founding board members. In 2013, Microsoft joined the board. In 2014, Frank Frankowski, one of the original founders and masterminds behind the Open Rack um, and, and Facebook's newest uh, data centers, left uh, Facebook to form his own company and which was later bought by Sony. And so Frank moved into an individual board member position and Jason Taylor from Facebook moved into the Facebook board seat. And so there were uh, five uh, organizational board members and two individual board members. Uh, and then, so now we have those seven seats. So if you take a look at the way our foundation is structured, it looks a little bit different than the way um, say Lenaro is structured. So you can see that the gray boxes, the board, the incubation committee, and our projects, um, those are all volunteers. So none of those are paid positions um, by the foundation. The folks in green are um, the paid positions. And right now, Facebook helps us with our sales support and, and supporting, um, um, if somebody wants to have more information about the Facebook SKUs and how to adopt them and how to use them. Yes? Can, can you hand that? Sorry, I didn't mean to make you the mic runner. Uh, uh, just some question. Uh, is uh, Google and uh, Amazon, other uh, this companies, a uh, member of this? Google is. This? Google is. Google and Facebook right now, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, are collaborating on a 48-volt uh, open rack V2 standard that they're creating right now. So we have a lot of collaboration between the, those organizations. Um, so you can see that, again, the green, the, the green is the employees, the gray is the volunteer, and right now the sales support staff is currently staffed by Facebook, but any board member company could help with, you know, with that. So I often tell people, for those of you who are familiar with the open rack, that as lean as, and vanity free as those racks are, we operate at the foundation level very lean as well. We all wear many hats. Any questions about, about this? No? So we, our IC members and our project leads work very closely together. And as you can see, we do have the uh, nine top level projects, certification interoperability, data center, hardware management, HPC, networking, open rack, server storage, and telco. So those are all of our nine top level projects. Now within two of those projects, networking and uh, storage, we do have some sub projects that I'll, I'll switch over to a web page here in a minute and show you some of those. You can see the technology verticals I was referring to. Who was that? I was telling you anyway. Technology verticals. So we have networking, server storage, and open rack, which if you think about how a rack is divided, when you think of the networking, you could think of compute. You think of the storage, and then you think of rack and power. That's our technology verticals. And all of our other um, uh, groups are industry verticals that have the potential to cross all of the other projects. So none of, like, well, we interchange certification and compliance, because again, we don't want to be the certification experts when there's other people out there to do the certification. So we just want to make sure that it's compliant, fits in the racks, and does what it says it's going to do. 
But you can see that we're not a, and Lenaro is the same way, or it used to be, any open cl and collaborative organization is not a step one, step two, step three process. It's a lattice, and you pick a point that where you want to come in, and you intersect at other areas. So if you're kind of turn this just a little bit, think of how lattice works. Someone could come in through like the telco group and have a cr contribution that could be a full rack solution, which would cross all of those. Could be a networking solution, which would just the networking group and the telco group would collaborate on that. So it depends on where you want to be and how you want to collaborate as to which project you want to come into. So you'll see that I have an asterisk by networking and server, and that's because I wanted to show that there, there is some overlap in the way we organize ourselves and the way you all have been um, organized too, in that you have your networking group and, we ha and your uh, enterprise group, and we have networking and server. Any questions so far? Yep, go ahead. How do you deal with the uh, overlap uh, uh, projects? Uh, you know, maybe you have the networking and the server in enterprise, and also have the similar project in telco. So how do you deal with these overlaps? We just schedule calls and invite everybody to the call and pick which mailing list everybody's going to jump on and discuss it. And then, you know, so it may start in the telco group, but need to go over to the other projects, and so sometimes everybody will be invited to the telco mailing list to collaborate there. Sometimes it'll be, well, this is more um, server-centric, so we'll go move it over to the server group to give them more opportunity to do that. And um, we just make sure everybody who needs to be part of it gets invited and has the opportunity to participate. Okay, maybe I think uh, maybe sometimes the different requirements from the telco and the enterprise will occur maybe, you know, for the same networking aspect. So, so they will do this in separate uh, well, group. We have, we, we have project leads that are experts in all of those industries. And so if it's the server side, like um, for our server leads, for example, we have one of our project leads is from Dell. The other project lead is from Microsoft. And so we have the engineering capabilities, you know, to look at, you know, those enterprise needs as well as, and then our community, when you look at 4,000 engineers participating, we have like experts ac across the industry. So we just figure out who needs to join. And those who are typically wanting to join and wanting to be part of it, jump into the conversation. So yeah, does that make, does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were gonna ask me a question. I was getting excited for a moment. So this is just one example. These right here are the no networking group specifications and design contributions that have been accepted. Not even the ones that are in the pipeline. There's probably another 10 or 12 sitting there in the pipeline. But these are just the ones that have been accepted so far. So we have the specification and designs. And if you go to our networking wiki page, you'll be able to have full access to those. Yep. Um, can we? Where's the other mic? Is there like, is, it, is there just two microphones in here? Yeah. Oh, okay. So to clarify, so you've got a, you've got a list of submitted, accepted design contributions there. Yep. One from a standpoint, if somebody submits it, does that mean anybody in the world can go build one of those designs? They have license to do that? And then two, what is your market share? Do you, have, do you, guys, do you guys track your success based on that? How many, you know, what percentage of the networking market is based on OCP? No. Okay. Now, okay. our sales channel, like we have a VP of channel who works with all of our suppliers, but the ODM, OEM, and vendor space is so competitive. Our vendors may say that we have, you know, X number of servers deployed in the financial area. We may have X number of, you know, racks that are deployed in the, oil and gas industry or we have whatever it happens to be right but we they won't ever give up their their names to say this is how many from this particular company because it is I mean it is and that's to protect their interest as well we're not here to be in the the sales business but we're in in the enablement business the to to remove the um, vendor lock-in if you will to create the white box spaces you know to drive innovation and put the power back into the consumer, into the adopter. You know, no longer is it a vendor driven, you have to accept the specs, as, or you have to accept this, for example, networking gear, you gotta accept the switch, 
the way I'm doing it or you don't get it, right? So we've taken all the mystery away and said, here you go. Um, so, put, so it's now a um, adopter-driven ecosystem. Okay, that make sense? Yeah. Now, ha given that and the work that you all are doing in the networking space, and you'll see most of our, we now have contributions from the x86 architecture and we have open power architecture. What we don't have is anything on the ARM space. So we'd love to see some ARM contributions come in as it relates to the data center. So if it's something that'll fit in a rack, monitor the rack or manage the rack, you know, um, anything like that, we'd love to see those contributions come in and see these two communities, you know, collaborate across that space. I talked to, uh, you know, Larry, uh, with uh, Cavium today about that because they do with Thunder X uh, surprisingly enough um, it just hasn't been contributed um, Thunder X they make the reference architecture freely available to folks like Penguin or Gigabit or, and those folks and so Penguin does have a sled that Thunder X fits in that slides into the V2 rack that is you know makes it powered by the bus bar however it's not being contributed so you won't see it on our server list so um, we'll have to work, so working together with you all in this community, um, with, with Cavium, you know, and with some of the folks who are enabling the software on top of these solutions, because they want to be able to market that their software runs on an open compute solution. Uh, a little full, full court press to get people to uh, sort of uh, contribute there. Any other questions about this piece of it? Yes, no, maybe? It's very weird for me to be sitting down and talking. Like I want to get up and walk around. So again, here's our top level projects. Can each of the groups have an IC representative? Oh, sorry. Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Can you talk more about your certification process? What that entails? So we don't certify anything. We, we don't, we manage the partnerships that do that. For example, we're not gonna certify that Red Hat OpenStack works on a particular SKU. Red Hat is gonna certify that it works on a particular SKU. Um, if if uh, Canonical wanted to certify that Snappy, matter of fact, they do, that Snappy runs on all of our contributed switches, they would do that and then they would link to it. They would make their test criteria public and we would create a database of which software works on you know, which open compute components. And so we, we, that group actually just m helps manage that relationship or points out what we need to do and how, we, you know, like we need to talk to this particular group and that kind of, you know, that kind of stuff. But we don't do the, we don't do the certification ourselves. Okay, so um, is it safe to say, well, maybe not, um, that the value add then for open compute would be collections or a, a database of all the certification done by um, various vendors um, and they have consumers then have a list of they know what works and what combination works or doesn't it, work and you all don't do any of the kind of interoperability between hardware or software testing? No, we, we don't and here, here's why. When you look across the board, you know, there, there's no reason why we as a small nonprofit entity need, you know, we don't have the engineers on staff or the QA expertise on on staff when there's many other organizations out there that do it much better and more efficiently and part of their membership would be to help you know with those efforts um, a good example we we have a UNH the University of New Hampshire their interoperability lab works very closely with our networking group they have a, a, a lab or a consortium that we're part of and we partner with them and anything going through our networking group has the ability to go through UNH's interoperability lab and we vetted that lab and, and approved what they're doing in that lab. And so we just work, you know, work with them and match up the resources and that sort of stuff. Matter of fact, one of the project leads um, for uh, the CNI group is w one of the leads at the interoperability lab at UNH. So um, the community elects those who are uh, experts in their fields to help drive um, most of that stuff. And this is new, so a lot of the stuff that you all are hearing about today is new stuff that we're rolling out, um, and like that searchable database, it rolls, it'll go live before the end of the year. It's in beta right now, um, and we're testing it out. And you'll see some of the criteria in order to submit here a little bit later. So, any other questions? No? So, what I was getting ready to say was all of our groups have 
uh, an IC representative, and they have the project leads. The IC representative and the project leads are all voted in by the community. They're not appointed by the foundation, and they're not appointed, um, you know, by the by the board. It's a community-led um, initiative. We have our online meetings. We have our wiki pages, our mailing list, and a section on the website. And each of these groups can, you know, be representative at our various events. And we have several events. We have a big summit. We have one a year. Unfortunately, it's going to be at the same time as Connect um, next year in March. So um, I'd love to see, you know, people from here there, but um, it's just not going to happen. We have our engineering workshops. Our next one is in London. So those of you who are near London and would like to come see um, our engineering workshop, it'll be November 2nd. Um, in conjunction with the DCD event in London. Um, we have our information days, which we roll out when we're getting ready to go into a new um, region, and that region may not know about Open Compute. And we have information day and invite anyone interested in Open Compute and go through um, how you can get involved. And we have our success stories. We, we invite vendors, we invite members, we invite other folks to get involved and, and see where their place is in the ecosystem. And then we have our meetups. So, any questions about about this? Yes, no, maybe. I probably don't need to tell you all this because you're an open and collaborative organization. However, well, you're member-driven organization, so you you all have members. And do they get they? I can't remember. Do they get access to your technology without being a member? Other than ninety-six boards, like that's a that's an outlier, but other than that, like to access to LNG or, or leg or any of that, do you have to be a member to get access to the stuff that's going on in those groups? Yes. Okay. You so, the right. But not to the, you can't provide thought leadership and join and, right. okay. So, in, in our community, the communication and participation is absolutely key. Um, it can't be like an exclusive group. It's got to be very inclusive, otherwise it doesn't work. There would be no way such a small group of people could um, herd all the cats. You know, when you're looking at all the contributions and you're looking at, you know, 4,000 plus people participating across, you know, nine, organ nine groups, unless we had um, very good communication and participation across all of that. It gets siloed very quickly if this doesn't happen. And so I'm not going to spend too much time on this piece of it, but you can see how the board and the foundation interacts, how that communication gets focused out, how the two groups between our IC and our project leads communicate, and then communicate outward to the rest of the world. And, you know, um, one of the things that community does, marketing builds a brand. And it's funny, no matter what event I go to, somebody will always ask, are you marketing? And then, Marketing builds the brand, community empowers the people. So um, without that empowerment, I'm, you know, I'm not just going to like broadcast out. I'm going to give you a lane of participation, a lane of how you can provide thought leadership and guide the future of those groups. Um, and so that open communication, the collaboration is key to driving the adoption or the consumption of open compute and the innovation, which is the, con the, the contribution. So when you have innovation on one side and you have um, the consumption on the other, the collaboration, if you thought of it as two sides of the coin, the collaboration piece is the binding agent that holds it together. If it's too lopsided toward adoption or too lopsided toward innovation, it won't work. It has to be a balanced effort across those three initiatives. And, and that transparency, transparency, how many of you all have been involved in other whether it's an open source software group or just an open and collaborative group, where there wasn't a lot of transparent communication between those who were in charge and those who, um, or those who were in leading the group versus those who um, were trying to participate, it creates this sense of distrust. And as long as the transparency is there and that collaboration is there, it builds participation and it builds trust it, um, with both the, the, those leading the group have trust in those wanting to participate, and those wanting to participate have trust in those leading the group. And you, I know, back to our Ubuntu days, we've seen where it happened wonderful situations and where it didn't happen in those situations. And so these are lessons learned from many years and in and around not just hardware groups, but software groups as well. And then I won't read the slide to you, but 
I'll make these available. Keys to participation and what, why you want to participate. Um, just better insight, awareness into the community, better to position and understand and, and leverage those solutions. And the key to it too is like people go, oh, well, they get, this person gets better treatment than I do. Well, sometimes people get answers quicker because if I know who's calling me and I, you know, I recognize the number or I recognize the person on the end of the email or I know who it is, not just me, but anybody, even in this organization, if you know who it is, you're more likely to answer their question quicker than, than and that's human nature, than someone you don't know. Because you're like, I don't know this person, who are they? Or I don't know their company, who are they? But a company who is actively participating in your project, actively providing thought leadership, actively um, engaging with you, you know them, you've heard of them, you trust, their, you, you trust what they're doing, and so you're more likely to either pick the phone up and call them back, answer their email quicker, or when you run into them to an event, at an event, to have that hallway track, to have that side communication. And, trans and the transparent communication and that collaboration piece of it builds all of that. So any questions or thoughts about this piece of it? No? I can't believe you're quiet. <laughs> so again, many ways to participate. We have our mailing list, which is our first line of communication, our lowest barrier of entry. Um, we have our online uh, meetings um, with all the projects have. Um, we have our events and we have our, uh, if you're in just like for here, if you, you all were at another industry event and say there was an OCP contribution, a, an arm contribution that, that came in from the Lenaro community to Open Compute and you were at an industry event and you say, hey, we're gonna be talking about our contribution to Open Compute and, you're, and you want someone um, from Open Compute in your booth, you know, it would be nice to have them there, right? And talk about the foundation efforts. So we, you know, we wanna know what you're doing at the industry events too and, and how that works. So, We do have some regional expansion going on. Right now we have approved um, communities in Japan and Taiwan. Uh, this year through mid 2017, we'll bring Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Korea online. And our model, surprisingly enough, is based on the loco teams. Um, that all the work we did, I have some history in the Ubuntu community, and so the work that we did on the charters and stuff for the um, loco teams there, we've carried a lot of that over or I've car carried a lot of that over into the self-governance model of um, our regional communities. So basically the communities follow the criteria to become um, a regional community. When they think they're ready, they contact the foundation, we evaluate it and then say yes or no. And then if we say no, we tell them what they need to do. If we say yes, then they get logos and other branding opportunities to do that. So it's a self-governing model. Um, we, just, we just give the lanes and the guidance for it to happen. So any questions about what I've talked about so far? No? So I tell you what, this is after lunch in Vegas and I bet everybody here had like a crazy night last night, right? So I'm gonna have to stand up and walk around here in a minute because <laughs> I'm just as tired as you all are. Um, so our membership levels, I got asked a lot of questions about this because um, I, our membership model is very different than any other nonprofit organization out there, especially around hardware and software. We're not a pay to play model. Um, and what I mean by that is that to get access to the specifications and designs, to come to our meetings, to join the online project meetings, to provide thought leadership and guidance, you do not have to be a member. Anyone, any one of you could go to our wiki pages and website and see all the information. There's nothing that's, that's, that's held back. There's no secret member places or, or anything like that. That wasn't a model that, that we wanted to have. It works for a lot of organizations, but we wanted to make sure that anyone who wanted to participate, regardless of how deep their pockets were, could. So we didn't want just tier one you know, folks to be able to participate. We wanted to go all the way down to the individual level. And while I'm focused here on the tiered membership, we do have an individual level um, if you're not associated with another organization and you just want to join as a member all by yourself, not, you know, not giving credit to your company, we have a free um, individual level. And what you'll see is when I get to the benefits, the more time and the more um, IP that you give, the less money you'll pay. Now, 
the exception is the, the community level. And we just added a $1,000 fee because we are giving logos, we're giving marketing, we have somebody that works solely on the community level members. And so, but the benefits aren't as great. Um, when you look at the startup, it's for silver. We have the two, two ways to get to silver. We have two ways to get the gold and we have one level, which is our highest tier, which is platinum. And that, re that is the level that requires um, both an IP contribution and a time contribution. At gold, you can write us a check and get the benefits for gold. At silver, you can write a check and get the benefits for silver. At community, you, can get, you write a check and get the benefits for silver. But to get that highest trademark, you have to give a contribution and you have to give time. So the more merit that you have, the less money um, that you pay. And so this slide's kind of busy, but um, it just sort of highlights all the different benefits that come along with, the, with membership. And the reason that, again, it's not to access the, the technology or anything like that, it's when you want a quote from the foundation or you want um, to be able to submit something um, and give us the IP, you have to be a certain level. And you want discounts on our summit, like a connect, if, if you're a member and you want a discount on sponsorship, <coughs> Um, and that can be pretty significant. For example, our platinum sponsorship um, for our summit that's coming up is 200K. But if you're a platinum member, you get your, you get 40K off of it. And so you might have to pay 40K to become a platinum member, but if you want to be a platinum sponsor, you get that 40K right back. So, um, and then you're eligible to become a solution provider and, and do all sorts of other things with us. But you can see the, the more time and effort or the more time and uh, IP that you give, the less money that you pay. So, any questions about, it's kind of a unique model. Um, any questions about that? Can you get the mic? Yes, no? Oh, I thought you were going to. So, I got asked this, a question earlier. Oh, and here's how we calculate the time. And so, somebody always asks, so I'm just gonna go ahead and address it. Somebody said, why do you count emails sent to a mailing list? Well, here's why. In organizations, and we saw this, well, I saw this when I was here, that there were a lot of companies that didn't want to participate on a mailing list, didn't want to do that open collaboration, didn't want, like they were afraid of that collaboration. Maybe afraid isn't the right word, but apprehensive. Like, what if I say something on this mailing list and my boss sees it? Maybe I wasn't supposed to say it. Or what if I misspell a word? Or what if I, any number of, of things that go through someone's head when they're um, openly contributing, right? Well, we are an open organization and we are, that collaboration piece is key. And so as part of their membership, they have to participate openly. And one of the ways we do that is to incentivize participating on the mailing list. And it also teaches folks a little bit at a time how to participate and how to get more involved. And soon, like one person from their organization will you know, start answering emails and joining the conversation, and then somebody else from their organization will start answering emails, somebody else joins in. So it's, a, it's, the, it's the first barrier of entry to get someone, an organization who isn't familiar with how to participate in an open and collaborative manner to get them to do that. And we give them, we, we count th that toward their time. And then at events, like come to an engineering workshop. Some it's not too bad to get people to come to because it's a big industry event. You know, there's, there's uh, sponsors, there's booths, there's things like that. Everybody wants to be there. Um, but we, we incentivize those things too because we want those organizations to come out and join conversations like this. Um, well, maybe a little bit more lively than this. And so, but, you know, we want the conversation going and we want, you know, we want that to happen. And so we, we do that, and, we, and it's eight hours per person per day of the event times a 1.5 travel multiplier. So if it was Connect, if we had a five-day event, um, and it would be, you know, um, eight hours per person from a company. Some companies probably have, what, 10 people here, so 80 hours that way, times five, times 1.5. So you're, you're looking, the hours add up very quickly, because some people say, 3,120 hours, that's a lot of hours. Well, not when you're actively participating, not when you're sending people to events and you're joining the conversations on the mailing list and you're doing that sort of stuff. It adds up very quickly. When people don't participate, that's when it doesn't happen. So, make sense? Everybody? Yep. And then we have our project leads, we have our white papers, um, things like that, our specifications and designs, and then depending on which license you use, there's extra, there's extra credit that's given as well. So, any 
pushing things? Anything that surprises anybody so far? Like you were surprised at how we work or, or some people say the biggest surprise to most people is that we're such a small organization. Um, but we're doing so much and have such a big footprint. Um, what's any other like anything that surprises you so far that I've talked about? I should have like seated like people to ask questions in this audience, like, or is it just all making sense and everybody wants to participate? And you want to figure out how you can get Leg and LNG to like partner with us and do stuff. Like that's it. Is everybody motivated to do that? Um, but yeah, so I think we have a pretty good model and I think we have a different model that's working for us. And I think that's one of the reasons that our networking group, our networking group has a little over 2,400 people signed up for it and has outpaced every other group with the exception of our server group um, and contributions. So, and it's only three years old. So, it's been, anything else? No. And then we have, again, our PR guidelines, probably boring to you all. But we don't allow folks to give quotes on, well, we intend to give this contribution. It has to be contributed, and we have to recognize it before we'll let people talk about it. Or at least us give a quote about it. And then you can get to all the support agreements and things. Are you curious about this part? No? Anybody? Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did somebody say yes? So when contributing to Open Compute, we have four really different types of contributions or four different types of things that can be recognized as a contribution. We have our Specification, which is paper, describes this hardware, you know, in detail. We have the design files, which, or the production files, which support that specification, but they also support the product. The product can't be contributed and licensed, but it can be, um, we can recognize that it meets the criteria and follows a specific spec and design, um, and we can uh, brand it, allow people to brand it, use the trademark of OCP accepted and inspired. Um, the trademark alone uh, goes with the, the OCP inspired trademark and the OCP accepted trademark follows the product. And as you can see here, all, whether it's inspired or whether it's accepted, it, both, it has to be based on an accepted specification. Somebody has had to contribute a specification for people to follow. The main difference between inspired and accepted is that accepted requires someone to sign over the IP to us, inspired is basically a glorified product sheet that we get to reformat. We have to have, um, there's a checklist, an extensive checklist that we kind of go through and make sure it's all being met. And then it has to have support agreements in place because what we found early on, and maybe maybe this is where you all could educate me, um, in that, that you've seen, especially on like the ARM side of, of hardware, when an organization opens up their specification on our side early on, they supported first user. So if we had maybe Facebook that gave a specification and then whoever their ODM was would make the hardware and make those designs available, but somebody else adopted that same SKU from them, there wouldn't be a support agreement in place from that other person, you know. It would only be first user, the person, the person who uh, opened it up or gave the specification. And so that made it very hard for adoption. Maybe like if one of you were to go out and buy that same piece of hardware and have trouble installing something on it or it wouldn't work and you go back to who you got it from and they said, well, it's based on the spec. There's a spec, you go figure it out. There wasn't support. So now we're requiring support. In order to brand it as open compute, a support agreement must be in place. Um, and so those are the main two differences. Any questions about this piece of it? Or are you finding it interesting or boring? So <laughs> I know it's after lunch, but like. So uh, I'm, I'm curious about how deep the specification goes and how deep the supporting uh, design bits are. I mean, so you, you specify this is a, a module, it's got to be this size and have these power connectors and whatever, but are you also specifying the board layout for the PCB? And so how's that work? No. so. Um, a good example, um, and I'll go, and I want to relate it to ARM specifically. So, how many of you are all familiar with Cavium's Thunder Expert? Okay. So, in that, Cavium created the board 
the chipset's arm. They didn't open up that chipset, but they said, here's the reference for the board they created, which is great. So then Penguin could take that same board and say, okay, we're going to make it fit in this chassis, which bolts into our bus farm powered by the bus farm and V2 rack, right? So it's not have its own power source. We want to know the reference architecture piece of it. I don't care what chipset's in it. I want other people to be able to innovate and drive that particular technology and be able to create, you know, an ARM server that fits into one of our racks, right? And so that the, the uh, specification, we our specifications, especially on the server side, are probably 80 to 90 pages long. And it's a very detailed description of that, of that board, if you will, um, for that. The rack, we have a rack standard that governs the V1 rack and the V2 rack that all specifications have to meet in order to be called open rack. Um, and so it gets, it, and you can go to the website, you can go to openyourview.org slash wiki and go to any of our projects and see any of those specifications that are there and you can dive as deep into it as you want. The idea being that if you take the specification and then you take the design files, someone should be able to take both of those and go bend metal if they want or innovate on top of it or create a new solution or, you know, make the next whoopty doo ladder, you know, out of it or whatever you want to call it. But you know what I mean? Like they should be able to go and innovate based on what is in the specifications and design files. So is there anything in the specification that relates to the software that you can run on that SKU? So whether or not the, the hardware uh, that, that no, you have not, on the SKU can... The, not in the specification, no. Right. Because here's the thing. So when you're dealing with with a lot of boards, especially like with BIOS and firmware and things, you know, things like that, right? Or BMCs, for example. Like, if you don't own it, you can't give it. You can't open it up. But if somebody's given a contribution that requires specific software or firmware, if you will, to run on it or a specific BIOS or, or a specific um, BMC that, you know, runs on it, they have to at least give a link to what it is. So, because you can't open up what you don't own, you know? So. Yeah, so the thing I'm thinking specifically of is things like uh, whether or not there's mainline support in the kernel for the hardware that's on the board. That's no, and again, we don't get into that piece of it. And let me show you the, ex the, the other layer that we've added now that we're rolling out. I'm just going to go over here. So if you'll look here, we have, we have the folks that give the hardware, right, whether it's accepted or inspired. Then we have folks who put it all together, right? They make a tested configuration based on open compute gear, and we're going to document that. And then we have your software vendors who would come in and verify their software works on this particular SKU, and then they would give us that instruction set. They would get credit for giving us the instruction set. We would create a library, and then we would help promote that in the searchable database. You could say, I want this particular SKU, and I want to see, okay, what what software runs on these servers, right? Or what software runs on these network switches or what, you know, and then we'll build that up. But we're just now starting to build, get into the software layer. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. And I think, let me look how we're doing on time here. Okay, so we got like three minutes and I have to shut up. But um, what I would like to see, and I would, if anybody has ideas around it, would really like to figure out you know, based, I mean, we have a pretty open model and allow for those partnerships and things like that. I'd really like to see how we can get some contributions, uh, you know, from ARM-based anything um, <laughs> into the data center space. Because people think ARM servers, but that's not the only thing that's used in a data center around ARM. You have the monitoring piece. Some, a lot of folks use ARM, um, ARM boards to do uh, the monitoring or or the management piece inside the data center, things like that. And so if there's contributions in, near, or around the data center that you can think of, let's figure out how we can help. We, we have two heads doing something there. Um, let's figure out how we can sort of form those partnerships. Or if your organization is interested in getting more involved in any of those um, nine top level projects and, and helping drive that, whether it's on the hardware side, whether it's on the software side, you know, but keep in mind, if you're software and you don't run on an x86 or an open power platform, because we have both, I don't know if any of you guys saw that Barrel Eye with IBM Rackspace and open power just went GA availability last week or week before last, we own that IP. They've contributed to us. So now we have the x86 architecture as part of open compute. We have 
the um, open power architecture that's part of open compute. I'd really like to see something for the data center that's ARM based. So we would have all three architectures as part of the open compute ecosystem and help drive that um, as well. So if, if you can think of those ways that we can do that and work together to do that, I would love to brainstorm with you and bring that back and wrap up, you know, wrap in my CTO and, and let's see what we can, uh, let's see what we can accomplish. But I hope I didn't put everybody to sleep and I hope that you're, I hope that it was just like drinking from the fire hose and you're just trying to figure out like what do I do with all this information. Um, but if you have questions or you want to talk about it later, please find me because I think it's great. I think the efforts that you all are doing here is great. This whole open hardware business and driving the innovation across all these multiple architectures, I want to drive it in the data center space. But if I can help, you know, make contacts and do other stuff, let me know. Yes. Not yet. I was introduced to them today um, to do some other stuff. So yeah. Well, that's the, some of it, yes, yes. Some of what they're doing, yeah. Well, some of what they do now. But if you come in with what it is you want, they're about making a reference platform, right? And so if you want ARM boards in, the, in this space, then you should work with them on a specification See, we which they can yeah, release. We, we wouldn't create the spec. It would be somebody here that says, I want this, and then whoever creates it with the 96 boards project, so we, we want to contribute it to open compute. Because we don't manufacture and sell anything. We just you, we would work with them and partner and make available your 96 boards folks to our community. And so that's how I see you know, that, that working. Uh, I, I caught that. Yeah. What I'm saying is what the 96 boards team does is they make reference yeah. boards that manufacturers out there can duplicate. They put, they do put the spec together, but uh, you would have to facilitate that process uh, in order to interest them. Yeah, we're, yeah, we have a meeting either later today or tomorrow sometime, yeah. Okay, so, well, good enough. Yeah, so we're gonna see how it works. I was, I was quite interested in that to see how it goes, but I, I also wanna see some of the, the folks that are involved in the enterprise group and the networking group um, to help drive that as well. Um, because I just think there's some opportunities um, that are there. So and I don't want to keep you from your next session, but thank you so much for coming and let me know if you have any other questions. Thank you.